SABC News presentation. Good evening and welcome to Interface. My name is Remus Mabote, standing in for Tembisa Machele, who, by the way, just got herself a little baby boy. Congratulations to her. Now, security is one of the cornerstones of any functional society. And the South African Police Service, however, has come under tremendous, tremendous fire in the last few months. And it has been compromised in the public face. Tonight, we look at police training in our country and explore solutions on how we could restore the image of men and women in blue. You may join this discussion. Comment on our Facebook page, Interface uh, on SABC3, or send us a text message, 33726. First, let's look at this insert by Inosi Queen. Andres Neyman is a busy man. When he's not running his transport business, he helps catch corrupt police officers. Andre has developed an internet system that records suspicious interactions between police officers and members of the public. I'm telling you about the traffic law, but the traffic law station is going to call two days, three days to come, uh, to come back to your house. It's going to take two days, and then you have to pay bail for that. If you have 1.5 a day, you can come, but if you don't have 1.5, it's a waste. The conversation is immediately emailed to over 900 people, including top cops, who are able to identify officers trying to commit crime or solicit a bribe. The biggest problem that we have is that the South Africans are losing faith in the police. And so many times when I get into an interview like this or I send out an email and I say a problem with the police, everybody thinks I'm a police hater. But I actually work very nicely with the police. So you can't stand on the fence. One minute you're not a good, you don't like police, the next minute you do like police. So what I'm trying to do is create relationships with the good police to catch the, 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 the bad cops. Police officers face dangerous criminals on a daily basis. Sporadic and violent protests around the country add to the demands of an already challenging job. But when officers themselves perpetuate crimes and are seen not to be doing sufficiently well to tackle it, they lose the trust in the eyes of the public. Research by the Human Sciences Research Council, HSRC, shows that public trust in the police in recent years is at an ultimate low. 50% of those surveyed say they have absolutely no trust in the police. Police visibility can make people feel safer, especially in overcrowded inner cities like this one. But corruption by some police officers often creates mistrust between members of the public and the police. Security expert Gareth Newham has conducted extensive research on challenges facing public policing in South Africa. If you give thousands of people powers, firearms, and tell them to go out and police the population, if they don't have proper management, proper support and training, you're going to have problems such as police corruption, brutality, the kinds of incidents we saw with Andres Tutani being killed, the high level of corruption we experience daily in South Africa, um, and that kind of problem. And then you start seeing police public trust is not as high in the police as it should be. And while there are many men and women of honor doing a good job of serving in blue, many believe that politics gets in the way of the police's ability to investigate without fear or favor. Newham says the closure of key specialized institutions such as the family violence, child protection and sexual offenses, as well as violent crimes units, has been one of the biggest mistakes by the SAPS. For a while now, the South African Police Service has kind of plateaued. The improvements that were happening have stopped, and we see this organization as a really large and important organization that plays a very critical role to improve public safety in South Africa, becoming a bit adrift. And that is because of poor leadership over a number of years. Genosequine Interface, Johannesburg. That insight was compiled by Genosequine. Tonight we're discussing police training in South Africa. A warm welcome to my guests, the South African National Police Commissioner, Ria Piecha, as well as Laura Polikert from uh, Ceasefire. Now, 
I have to ask you this question, which was sent to me earlier today before the, the show started, uh, National Commissioner. And I was asked to ask it in this way. Oscar, so and so the guy. Because we're very good. Tata really my podies. Rena limu se vedi omungata. And we we stand to go 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 dira go re. The chavasar na sa South Africa. Se bolo kere se bele koto ni se pile kani. It's been three and a half months in the job. Is it what you expected? I was talking to Paula just now when we got here. I was saying my understanding and my view of SAPS when I was outside and my view when I'm inside has been totally revolutionized. In what sense? I have met a community of highly committed people. I have met a community of very hard working people. I have met a community of people who are in one in terms of what they need to do. I have met a community of people who understand their mandate and remit as given by the constitution of this country. What about what we read in the media, what we watch on television and hear on the radio? It, it seems to give us a different picture from what you're telling us. Absolutely. I sit inside and I actually pinch myself and I say, are they talking about us? I ask myself that question because what I see, what I read, what I experience, what the police are doing is very different from what you read in the newspaper. And as a result, you know, I've been going on a massive research to just try and check what's happening in other countries. I've used, for instance, the US as a case study. I know that they've gone through the process that we've been through until they went to programs such as Hollywood, had programs that were starting to talk about uh, the actual cases of what police are doing and what they are achieving. What we are lacking in this country is good news marketing and actually recognizing the work of the police in this country. Laura Polakat, you, I'm sure Sis Fire won't agree with the view that uh, the, com the commissioner is painting now. Well, I think firstly that the commissioner, by her own confession, has only been in the job for a few months, so um, I'm sure she's seen the best of it at this point. And I'm sure there are very good people in the police force, and I have great sympathy for the job that they have to do. Um, I think that we've, we've come a long way since uh, we had what was called then the South African Police Force. We are now the South African Police Services. And I think sometimes we forget that, that we're supposed to be a people-orientated police service and not a force, not what is becoming more militarized every time we see them in action, which is troubling to those of us who watch the growth going away from what the apartheid police was and moving back a little bit towards what it was before. Uh, that's a little bit disturbing for us. But that's not to say that everything is bad about it. However, it seems like a luxury to say we should not militarize the police force when the country is such violent it itself. Well, I was speaking to the commissioner earlier on about this, and um, I'm afraid I disagree because um, you, don't, you, you, you don't deal with violence by using violence. You have to address it from many perspectives, obviously. You have to address the socioeconomic issues. Um, you have to um, teach children from when they're very young that violence is not the solution to, to the problems that we have. Um, we have to have we, we have to have some kind of control of weapons in this country. Hold that thought. Hold that thought because I want us to talk about that and, uh, and also police training when we come back. 33726 okay. is our SMS line or interface on SABC3. That's our Facebook page. When we come back, we continue this conversation, especially on training and militarization of the police. Welcome back with us in studio is South African National Police Commissioner Ria Piecha and Laura Polikat of Ceasefire. I'd like to go back to the issue of crime. And I'm going to ask you as a mother, as a, as, a, as a woman, are we winning the war against crime? 
yes, South Africa is winning the war against crime. And I do want to say our minister recently announced our crime statistics results. And for a change this year, coming in, I actually asked them to say, I don't know how you measure social phenomenon using through a single year window. I asked them to take all their statistics for the past eight years. We took a longitudinal view and all social scientists would agree with me to say, if you want to understand any phenomenon, take a long-term view. And when we looked at, at, at the phenomenon, in a number of those areas, we really started seeing significant decline in some of those areas. And I do want to say, I mean, areas such as uh, murder, attempted murder, assault, you see very significant decline in terms of those. There are some of the areas that are almost getting extinct. Areas such as, uh, you know, bank robberies. You see that graph almost, I think it's some of the crimes that in time will not be there. We saw a significant change in terms of uh, ATM bombs, even though it migrates from time to time. But uh, I must say, there are some areas that we still need to deal with, business robberies, particularly in the small businesses. There are some of those areas that are, are slightly stubborn and we'll put more effort to those. But I do want to say South Africa is making a significant inroads into the decline of crime in this country. Then let's go back to mil militarization, Laura. Uh, in fact, I should have called the National Commissioner General. That's, uh, that's her title. Uh, mm. What's wrong with this? I, I find that it's probably semantics that we call them generals or commissioners, or does it really matter? Well, I think it matters a great deal because they're very different functions within a military environment to within a policing environment. And um, uh, funny enough, we were also talking just beforehand, you used that term and she used the term, we're winning the war against crime. We don't have to call it war. We need to talk a little bit uh, more openly about what it is about. It's the language that um, we have um, taken from uh, military uh, language and, and brought it into the police, uh, the police services where uh, I don't think it's necessary. I want to feel that um, any child will feel very comfortable coming up to a police officer and you know that old thing of asking the police officer the way or whatever and I don't know by projecting this incredibly tough macho militarist image whether you're going to get that kind of relationship with the community. And certainly we've seen this in the relationships when there are protests in the community, when there are, um, uh, when, when the police come in and are very violent with those communities. Um, yeah. So well, the police are violent, Laura, and by the way, we're going to take your SMSs on 33726, and you can also get into our interface page, interface on SABC3, and we will read them when we come back. You know, there's a story that I remember vividly, 2006 in Jeffistown, Johannesburg, when the police trade uh, criminals into a house mm. and, and four police uh, officers were shot and killed by very violent people. Of course, eight of those uh, criminals were killed. Now, you, you can't be claiming that this is a peaceful society where we don't, you know, we don't need a militarized police force. Now, I'm sorry, you, you are equating a militarized police force with um, dealing with crime. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be militarized to deal with crime. And in fact, the, some of the South American countries where there are very militarized um, forces, so to speak, dealing with crime, excessive violence from on their part, it hasn't worked. It hasn't brought down the crime. Um, Ria, the oh, National Commissioner. It's okay. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the, the story that I just mentioned of 2006, by the way, I want to take you back to it, mm. but this time the context is training. Mm. Because that story left me with an impression that there's, there's not adequate training. But in a situation like that, I would have thought the cops would use stun grenades than to walk into real danger like that and leave four of their members dead. Rams, let me tell you that uh, the training is, subs is quite intensive and it is broad. I think in this continent and elsewhere in the world, our training is highly respected. Even in some of the instances where we are having, you know, memorandums of agreements with other countries where we are doing further training, intensified training, I really believe that uh, our police are very well trained. 
I think we need to advance some of the conversations and dialogues that we're having. That there is police bashing we cannot run away from. And uh, I'm not sure how much of the conversations are going to get us out of that morass. To start celebrating that we need to celebrate and encouraging continuous improvement where it should be. I'd like not to celebrate, yeah. but I get to worry when there's 18,000 firearms lost in six years. Between 2005 and 2011, 18,000 firearms in the hands of police officers mm -hmm. get lost. Remember, we recover those firearms, and our recovery rate is quite high. Some of them we're not able to account for because they come back filed off. Even if we recover, some we can, you know, about 80% of those we can link to our firearms. But some of those that are completely filed off, it becomes very difficult to start saying, is this our firearm or is it a firearm that comes from elsewhere? My, my worry is the, the act of losing them. That, that it, it seems that a police officer is not well trained to make sure that their firearm is let never me, lost. Let me, let me give you an example, and I'll touch on something that I'm not going to talk about. You are busy with a protest of uh, a labor unrest, and the police are attacked, and a gun is taken. We look for it for a very long, long time. But we are having, you know, this attitude that whatever we lose, there's just volition of police throwing away their guns. Yes, there are problems. And when that happens, we intervene. We discipline our members for losing their guns. It's not just an easy, easy way of getting out of that process. And we recover. And we will continue to improve our rate of recovery. Interface on SABC3, that's our interface page. SMS 33726. We will be back with more on SAPS training after the break. Welcome back. My guests are South African National Police Commissioner Ria Piecha, security expert Laura Polikat from uh, ceasefire. I'm going to read some of your SMSs that came to us on 33726. Uh, this one says, police are ma a major cause of crime. That's anonymous. In fact, others are Facebook uh, messages. Tomani Chauke says, cops are being killed every day. We need a solution. Blondie Machata says, what are the commissioner's plans on combating crime? Sfisom Charlie says, will the quality of police appointment be enhanced by at least hiring qualified people. Mm. The force is known to hire matriculants with no driver's licenses. In fact, this question came up even much earlier, but uh, I'll get you to respond to this. I want to go back to training, uh, National Commissioner. It is, not an, it is not strange nowadays to see police officers who are slightly on the other side of good weight. Mm. Now, that, that doesn't encourage confidence. You know, for me, I, I know a history where the South African Police Service, whatever it was called many years ago, in fact, used to even supply great uh, people to, to play in the rugby force and who were athletes, who were, who were great sports people. Now we're seeing a bit overweight members of your force. I'm talking about that physical training that okay. I'm not seeing. We do a lot of that. And um, my response to that is that uh, you would know that uh, General Kelly was one person who spoke about uh, chest out, stomach in. <laughs> that philosophy continues. We, you, are talk, you are talking about uh, sports, sports academies. We have great championships in, 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 in SAPS. I've just gone recently to Pretoria West to light the fire for the, ch the sports championships in, in, in SAPS. We participate in SAPCO, in continent-wide uh, you know, sports activities. We are in various sporting codes. We are in rugby, we are in athletics, we are in all what those things. What about these overweight ones we see? This is where I'm saying I'm taking the baton from my predecessor, predecessor to say the principle of continuing with a fitness training remains very, very crucial and important. We have gyms. We are looking at expanding those to ensure that our members 
would have access to gyms where they can actually improve their physical fitness. But most of them look very, very, very fit, right? You would agree with me, and they look beautiful in their blue and... Uh, <laughs> Because, see, Laura, I, I tend to think that uh, an overweight police officer is more likely to use their firearm because they can't chase after a criminal. Ah, no, I don't think that. Ah, I, don't think you you can, I don't think you can use, reach that conclusion. <laughs> I, I actually, um, I, don't, I don't think that's correct. I think there are also police officers, by the way, who choose not to carry guns. Mm -hmm. um, we had two police officers come and talk to us about the work we do around domestic violence and the Firearms Control Act. And the one officer didn't carry, he had chosen not to carry a firearm, and the other one carried a firearm. Yeah. So it's not everybody who carries a firearm, thank goodness. Um, and maybe those who are a little overweight are more congenial and less likely to shoot at people. <laughs> I would hope so. <laughs> Investigation capacity. Uh -huh. uh, it, that, you know, the policing is the first entry towards solving crimes. and. An example we got from a Facebook message said that, you know, when I go out and report a crime, a robbery in my house, the first thing that the police ask is that, are you insured? And it sends a message to the, to the writer that they say, we're not going to be able to investigate, so go claim and, and let's solve this thing quickly. Go get some money from insurance companies. Turn that question around to say, isn't it the beginning of investigation? Are you insured? Because maybe there is, you know, there is a lot of conning of insurance people. You know, I think, I think at times, you know, we are very glib in terms of how we read things into that. And this is why I say to you, Rams, we do need to deal with societal attitude, societal perceptions about policing. Let me talk about our detective work. There is a lot of investment that has gone there. You know, in the cluster that we are in, the security and safety cluster, government has invested a lot of money to ensure that uh, we upgrade you know, the, our capacity to be able not only to investigate, to arrest, but also to secure convictions. We've put in a lot of money in detective training. We have a special academy that has been opened in PAL, and uh, we just made a report, uh, you know, uh, you know we're, we're giving our annual report to Parliament last week. And the detectives came out very, very positively in terms of their review, in terms of the report that they gave. We're making a lot of good progress in that space and we continue focused on that because we know, as you say, the entry point of uh, conviction is good investigations. And good investigations also mean that there's an organization called the Independent Police Investigative Directorate, IPIP, yeah. which has had a terrible report on, on your organization, uh, bad behavior of cops. You know, there are so many policemen who have been investigated and in fact, IPIP says that not many that have been found to have been to have done wrong have been have been dealt with by your organization. I'm not aware of that. Of in terms of us, not not you know, there's a lot of consequence management in the police. Just now, we've been you know negotiating and talking with labour and other stakeholders around even tightening our disciplinary outcomes. Consequence management is very critical. In terms of IPID, surely there must be somebody who police the police, and they must do their work and. Uh, as and when they give us feedback, we use the feedback to deal with it. And you would know that life doesn't offer you absolutes. There will always be some rotten potatoes. It is our duty to deal with those. And we do deal with those. We're running out of time, Laura. There is a role for general public to play to make this country safer. It can only be the police oh. service. What role, what, what is our role as society? Well, I think that... Um, being part of community policing forums is an important part. And I think um, um, familiarizing yourself with, um, with the legislation around um, very relevant uh, policing issues helps, although it's very difficult if you don't have access to that um, kind of information. And I'm thinking about people who um, get accused of illegal gatherings and not knowing about the Regulation of Gatherings Act, uh, how would they know about this act generally? It's certainly not promoted or encouraged in certain areas. So, I mean, it's difficult if you're not disseminating information. Just quickly, I want to read you this, this uh, Facebook message. I think the president was very right by appointing an executive lady to, to lead the SAPS. 
I'm sure you'll be happy to hear that. Unfortunately, I'm not even going to get you to respond to this. We've <laughs> run out of time. Thank you very much, National <laughs> Commissioner and Lord of Politics. Right. That's it for tonight. Interface will be back again next week. Email us on interfaceon3 at sabc.co.za or catch us on Facebook. From me, Rems, Mabote, and the team, goodbye and good night. <laughs>